Welcome to the Productivity Show, a podcast where we believe that you can get the important things done without having to sacrifice your health, family, and things that matter to you. My name is Tan. I'm the founder and CEO of Asian Efficiency, where we help people become more productive at work and in life. And today I'm joined, of course, by my co-host, Brooks Duncan. How are you today, Brooks? I'm great. My son is about to take his driver's test in a couple of days. So my life's about to be a lot more productive, hopefully uh, not having to drive them everywhere. So I'm very, 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 very looking forward to that. Ooh, that's awesome. Um, sounds also like you might have a free driver for you and your wife, uh, maybe for nights out or something. And you can tell them to pick you up from the airport, which I think is a nice convenience as always. Exactly. Uh, Sounds like a good deal to me. It just took you uh, 16 years or 18 years of uh, raising a kid. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, now, today on the podcast, we're going to be catching up on what's been happening in our industry, but also new trends that we see unfolding that we want to make sure you're aware of so you can stay ahead of the curve. So some of the things we're going to be talking about today are, you know, can you get away with a task manager built into your platform? Or do you need to buy a separate task manager? So is that a solution? Is that a var variable thing that you can do? Uh, the other thing we're going to be talking about is, uh, is AI-generated writing and speech the future? There's a lot of stuff happening in this industry that I think is very interesting. And the third thing we're going to be going over is, is it more productive to focus on one screen or device? Or is it better to have multiple screens and devices? Uh, this is something we're going to be discussing here today as well. And uh, you can find links to everything that we share on the show notes by going to theproductivityshow.com slash 406. And uh, to give you a clue what's happening next week, uh, next week's episode is all about how to create a morning routine that works for you, even if you are not a morning person. So uh, be sure to tune in next week. And uh, Brooks, let's just uh, kick off the episode with our top three favorite resources. All right. So resource number one is a VPN service called NordVPN. So I know a lot of members of our community use it. I know, Tan, you use it as well. Uh, there's lots of great VPNs out there. Some of them have sponsored the Productivity Show in the past. Uh, and uh, NordVPN is the one that you happen to be rolling with right now. And from what I understand, it's a, it's a pretty good one. So NordVPN, that's number one. Number two is Apple AirTags. So for those who don't know, they're little, uh, little physical devices that you can put in uh, anything really uh, and able to track it down. Uh, so you could put it, I hear some people who travel put it in their luggage so that if their luggage goes missing, uh, they'll know where it is. Uh, I've heard of somebody putting it in wallets. Uh, I even heard of somebody who does hiking, put it in their bear canister so that if an animal comes and takes off with their food, uh, they can track it down. So <laughs> these are just a few of the uses of Apple AirTags, but anything you can think of to track things down, uh, it's really, really handy. That's number two. And number three is a portable battery. It's the Anchor Mago, uh, M-A-G-O, not sure the correct pronunciation for that, uh, portable battery. There's a ton of portable little power banks out there, of course. Uh, the cool thing about this one is it supports MagSafe, number one. And number two, it's foldable. So it's great for planes and stuff like that to watch movies. Uh, I don't personally have this one. I think, Tan, you put it on this list. But after looking into it, I will be buying it right after I recorded this uh, episode because it looks really great. Uh, so yeah, those are the top three resources. Awesome. So uh, let's just start diving into today's uh, episode here. So as always, with this type of format, we like to kick it off with some newsworthy updates. And uh, Brooks, I see we have three of them here. Uh, can you walk us through what's, uh, what's the latest and greatest? All right. So the first one is uh, related to Microsoft. So they recently had a hybrid work event. This is something that I've noticed that a lot of companies are really focusing in on. Uh, for a long time, people were really focusing on uh, work from home, how to help people work from home uh, once uh, because of the pandemic and all the stuff we all know about. Uh, now, a lot of people are going back in the office. So for example, my wife's company this particular week, uh, they've all started working back in the office. Uh, but for a lot of companies, it's a hybrid situation where some people are in, uh, some people are out, and that adds its own challenges. So Microsoft just had a work, an event uh, where they talked about Windows 11 features that can help with hybrid events and just announced some other features as well. Uh, so one of them is Start Menu 
menu folders. So uh, it sounds kind of crazy because start menu folders have been around Windows forever, uh, but Windows 11 actually uh, acts the ability to have folders for your start menu items, uh, but they're adding them back. So I'm sure this is by popular demand. So that's great to know. Number two, some productivity improvements like favorite files and new snap layouts. I'm a big fan of snap layouts. So these are the ability to have your windows set up just how you like them. Uh, and these, these types of things, you know, favorite files versus favorite folders, but actual favorite files and these snap layouts, they're Honestly, we've talked about this on the podcast before, kind of our favorite type of changes. They're like small improvements. None of them is going to really set the world on fire, but they're things that you do all the time uh, that make you a little bit more productive because you use them all day, every day. It really, really adds up. Uh, that's another one. And a third one, uh, there's lots of updates, but a third one is they're going to introduce live captions. So you can caption any audio source. So if you have uh, any type of audio playing, uh, it will live translate it and show the caption. So this is huge for accessibility, a bunch of different things, but accessibility for one thing. Uh, and this is a, a, an amazing update. It doesn't have to be built into the audio. It will do it live. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. We'll have a link to an article that takes you through a bunch of these different updates. Uh, so yeah, that's the first one, Microsoft's uh, hybrid work event. Number two is Google is going to start letting you block, well, it's actually live now, certain categories of ads. So you've always been able to block ads. If you see an ad that you don't like, you know, you can block that advertiser, that sort of thing. Uh, but there are certain categories of ads that Google is now allowing you to just say, hey, I don't want to see these at all. And so for starters, you can block ads for alcohol products, dating products, gambling products, pregnancy and parenting products, and weight loss products. So those are kind of like the four main categories so far. Uh, I really like this because first of all, even if you don't have um, particular issues with any of those particular areas, uh, I still think it's good to turn off the ones that you're not interested in because the more you can remove the distractions, uh, the better. So I say just go into your um, Google account settings, go to the ads uh, settings and just turn those things off. Uh, the more we can kind of like reclaim our attention, uh, the better, I think. So that's the second one. And number three, uh, back to Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Edge, which is the browser that is built into Windows, uh, is adding in a, a built-in VPN. So we talked about NordVPN, which is great. However, why not have one built right into your browser? So, uh, so you can get more privacy, uh, you can block tracking a little bit. Uh, the only thing is, uh, and this is, you know, a theme we're going to be talking about with built-in tools, you know, it's not as flexible and powerful as the, um, as the third-party ones like NordVPN and ExpressVPN and those type of things. Your data is only limited to one gigabyte a month. You need to be signed into your uh, Microsoft account. Uh, and then this is, this VPN is actually run by Cloudflare. So, uh, which is a, a very trusted name in online uh, security and we use Cloudflare ourselves. Um, but yeah, I think everyone should have a VPN. Uh, so if you don't want to sign up for one of these services, then yeah, the one built into edge is great. Uh, what do you, what do you think about these 10? Yeah, I think the VPN built in is really smart because typically there's a little bit of a learning curve to using a VPN, even though it's relatively simple. Most people just don't know what it is and how to use it and, and set it up and being able to have it built in in your browser, maybe just with one click, have it turned on, I think, uh, brings in a lot more security for a lot more people. And, uh, it's great, for example, if let's say you're traveling or you're staying at a hotel and you just need some quick security to kind of log into your bank account or whatever, then turning that on within the browser is is like an easy thing to do. So I think that would be super helpful for situations like that. And uh, I'm glad to see that Microsoft is updating and, and working on um, uh, making improvements, which like you said, it's not world changing, but all these little things really start to add up. And I think that's why the Mac operating system has always been so popular and powerful because all those small changes and iterations really add up over time, which is, you know, a big idea that we always talk about here at AE as well. Um, so as far as like the ads, I'm personally, uh, I, I don't know if I would like to admit this, but I use uh, an ad block uh, <laughs> uh, extension in my Chrome. So I usually don't see ads anyway. Um, but I can also see how this could be really helpful for places where you can't really block ads. 
Um, or sometimes you have to visit a website where you can't visit and read the content unless you turn off your app locker. And so for situations like that, I think it would be very helpful. Um, but again, it's one of those things that, you know, if you don't know, you don't know, but if you know now that you can turn it off, I think it's really empowering. So if you, uh, if you want to stop those ads from being, um, on your screen, I think uh, it's worth setting it up and we'll have a link to it as well to kind of show you how to do that. It's, it's pretty simple. All right, All right. So Brooks, uh, let's uh, talk about uh, what's happening in our space here. But before we do, I want to make sure that uh, we give a shout out to our TPS Plus listeners here. So in case you're not familiar, we have an upgraded version of the podcast called TPS Plus. And uh, it's kind of our uh, special version of the podcast because it doesn't have any ads. It comes a week out earlier than other episodes. You also get bonus content as well when you join, plus a bunch of other things. So it's an upgraded version of the podcast and uh, it's relatively cheap. It's a way for you to support the podcast as well. So if you want to find out more information about how to upgrade your podcast experience with us, go to theproductivityshow.com slash plus. So that's P-L-U-S. And uh, if you sign up for an annual subscription, you also get a really popular t-shirt from us. So uh, I want to give a shout out to everyone who is a TBS Plus member. And uh, thank you so much for supporting the Productivity Show. We really appreciate it. And uh, going back to regular content here. So uh, we have three topics that we want to go over here. And uh, the first one is, can you get away with the task manager that's built into your platform? Or do you need a separate task manager? Uh, Brooks, I'm kind of curious, what is your take on this? Yeah, I, I was thinking about this recently because I was reading a review on ZDNet of Google Tasks and the reviewer gave it a 9.0 outstanding rating. And I thought, wow, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty good. Like, uh, I want to use an outstanding task manager and we'll have a link to that review in the show notes. Uh, but it got me thinking about that and I, I, you know, I read through the review and it looked, it looked totally fine. Uh, and it got me thinking about, you know, there's Google tasks. There's of course the to-do that is built into Outlook and Microsoft's, uh, Microsoft's platform. There's reminders in Apple ecosystem. So it made me think, do you even need a third party task manager? It used to be that there weren't any built in good options. Uh, but now pretty much every platform that we use, uh, even Evernote has really released Evernote tasks and stuff like that. It seems like there's so many built-in options now. Do you even need a specialized task manager? So it got me thinking of some of the like pros and cons of this. Uh, and here's what I was thinking. I'm curious what you think about this, Tan. Uh, so for built-in, so these this could be like the Google one, the Microsoft one. Uh, some of the pros are it's already integrated with the tools that you use, or at least the operating system tools that you use generally. Uh, there's often really built-in integrations like Outlook. It's, you know, you can't really get much more built-in than that task button and the to-do button and the flag integration uh, right there. And same for Apple and Google. Uh, the people you work with probably use it too. You know, if you're a Microsoft shop, you're using probably Microsoft to do, uh, and probably your coworkers are using that too. And maybe they're not even allowed to use anything else. Uh, so that's another example. And same if, if you're in the Google ecosystem. Generally, they're more simple. So generally, there's a limited learning curve. You know, if you know how to use Google's tools, if you know how to use Microsoft tools, generally, you'll pretty easily figure out how to use these built-in task managers. Uh, and yeah, generally pretty simple to use. Um, so, you know, <laughs> kind of overwhelming, um, overwhelming case for using a built-in tool, but there are some, I would say, cons of using a built-in tool. Number one, uh, yeah, there's good integration with the kind of operating system and platforms that you use. That's great. But often there's pretty limited integration with other tools. So if you are able to use other like um, project management tools, email tools, calendaring tools, that sort of thing, uh, you, there's pretty limited integration with those where a lot of times third-party task managers have that built in, like Todoist, for example, can integrate with a lot of different things. Uh, so that's one limitation. Number two, if you have more complex needs, uh, a lot of times these, uh, these more built-in simple task managers and to-do lists are kind of limited. You know, you can fake a lot of stuff with maybe some tags and stuff like that. Sometimes you can do sub 
uh, subtasks and that sort of thing, but often it's pretty limited. So if you have more complex needs, uh, sometimes you end up having to like jump through hoops where using a more specialized tool uh, just makes things a lot more easier. Uh, but for me, the biggest thing is a lot of times what happens with these big, a lot of times what happens with these built-in tools is after a while, they kind of get abandoned or there's like infrequent improvements. Like just think about uh, the reminders built into Apple's ecosystem. Essentially, those only get updated if you're lucky uh, when, there's a, when there's a new release of iOS. You know, maybe there's little tweaks here and there. Uh, and so it could be a, go a couple releases without any big changes. Uh, so ideally, if you're somebody who lives in breeze in your task manager, you ideally would like to have a situation where it's the people who like live and breathe these things and are constantly trying to make them better. Um, so that's my thought. If you have really simple needs, I would say just roll with the built-in one. Um, but if you're a little more complex, it's good to look at other options. Uh, what's your thinking, Tan? I, I know I personally use OmniFocus. Uh, I think you do too. Uh, but what's your thinking about all this? Well, I would say if anyone that's listening to this particular podcast here, so the productivity show, you're probably a little bit more intermediate and advanced than the typical person. And when I think about all these tools that are built in, they're really designed for the everyday person. So yes, they have integrations with the operating system or the tools, uh, tool suite that you use. So if you're in Microsoft tool suite, then it integrates with all the tools that they have, right? And just like if you're on the Mac operating system, a lot of the built-in stuff just kind of works together. So if you are particularly tied to one ecosystem, I do think that using the built-in tool is a great starting point because it just makes things a little easier. It, the alternative is you just use pen and paper for the things you need to do, or the digital version of that would be the built-in tool, right? And it's free, it's easy to use someone like my mom and someone like my dad would be like perfect for this kind of thing. They use one operating system. Typically they don't have like cross platform issues at all. And so using something like that would be great. However, I would say for the average TPS listener here, you probably have a little bit more complexity. So maybe you have cross platform, maybe you have like a, a MacBook at home, but also you use like a, a, an Android tablet, for example. Right. And now when you have two competing operating systems, how do you have some sort of uh, sync in place? Well, you don't when you use one particular tool from one operating system. So if you run into that already, where you have uh, different operating systems working, then you need a more complex tool. And that's where something like web base could be coming in, like uh, Todoist, for example, or you use a, an app or tool that is cross-platform. And so I think for the everyday listener that, is listening to us, I would say you're probably a little bit beyond that, uh, but that doesn't take away that some of these tools are really powerful as well. So for example, even though I uh, have OmniFocus and have a you know pretty complex system for uh, compared to most people, I still use reminders for very simple things for like stuff that I need to do today, or I just say, hey, uh, you know, S-I-R-I, <laughs> I need you to remind me to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, on this date or, or at this time, that's a really simple tool that I still like to use. So um, yeah, I would say for everyday person, probably uh, great. But if you're a TPS listener, then you're probably going to run into more complex needs. In the live stream, uh, one of our Productivity Academy members, Art, has a hot take. He says, if spending $100 a year on OmniFocus saves you a minute a day, it's more than worth it. And uh, yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. If you can get make use of those features uh, and it does make you, like, like we just said, a, a bit more productive every single day, uh, that really, really adds up. So yeah, yeah good take. Good take there, Art. Uh, all right, let's do topic number two then. And topic number two is... Is AI generated writing and speech and fill in the blank uh, X, uh, is it the future? And the what prompted me to think about this is that the other day uh, when she was working from home, uh, my wife called me upstairs to our bedroom in the middle of the day. Uh, so I go up the two flights of stairs and, uh, and she said she wanted to show me a video that a colleague made. And he had used this tool called... I don't know how to pronounce it, but I'm going to say MUFI, M-U-F-I, and we'll have a link to it. Uh, he used that tool to create it. And basically, 
all the speech was AI generated. So they, they kind of like had the, the visuals that they wanted. They had like the script kind of that they wanted, but the, the text like turned it into like this really good voice with like emphasis and pauses and all that sort of stuff. And apparently her marketing colleagues use this all the time because it makes so, it's so fast and easy to create content. There's also tools like uh, Jasper.ai is one that will take a concept uh, and then write it for you, you know, blog posts, articles, any type of writing in the format that you request, uh, you kind of give it a little bit of info, it learns over time, and then it will write this stuff for you. And there's like Memex, which is note-taking API. There's all these frameworks like uh, GPT-3 and DALI, where you can say like, hey, I want a picture of... Uh, three pillars and it says like time, energy, and attention, <laughs> and it will like, you know, generate it for you and that type of thing. Uh, you know, none of this stuff is maybe like hundred percent here yet, but you can kind of see the writing on the wall that with the kind of content that you want created, AI could take it like 80 to 90% of the way. And then you just, if you need to put it your own polish on it. And it just made me wonder like all this stuff that we do, you know, here at AE, but also if you're working in your job and you need to make a presentation, you need to make slides or something like that. Uh, is this going to change or how is this going to change things? Like, you know, are we going to sit here and be boomers and write, <laughs> write the podcast show notes manually like we do every week? Or do we just say, Hey, I want an article on uh, the Pomodoro or I want an episode on the Pomodoro technique and some AI is just going to like generate it out. Uh, have you been paying attention to this uh, AI stuff, Tan? What do you, what do you think of it? So Jasper.ai, um, is a tool that kind of helps you write blog posts and advertisements. And uh, this company is actually based here in Austin. I actually know the founder of it. And uh, I know some of the people that work there. So I've seen it kind of grow over the years and they have a lot of raving fans. And I think for very specific use cases, something like um, AI generated content can be very helpful, especially when it doesn't require, uh, let's just say a human element to it because one thing that AI cannot do is write interesting stories because it just has no context, right? So it can't share a story about, I don't know, X, Y, Z of that happened last week because it just doesn't have that information. However, when it comes to writing an advertisement, for example, um, when you do it, you start to realize it's very formulaic after a while. A headline has a very specific format. Um, a subheadline has a very specific format as well. Uh, maybe an introductory paragraph of something can be very specific as well. So for specific use cases, I can kind of see how that would be really helpful. Uh, also, like you mentioned with your wife's case where um, they turn text into voiceover, for example, or some of the speech was generated that way. Uh, I think a very specific use case like that is super helpful as well because it's going to help you save time, right? Just like the AI technology we have for editing the podcast, um, what's that thing called again that you looked into the other day? It was like Disruptor or something, the script? Oh, script. Descript, yeah, Descript, yeah. Yeah, like stuff like that makes things so much easier because now instead of having a human editor, Descript can now do it for you and probably with like 95% accuracy or something, right? So I think there's very specific use cases for it, but... I don't see it ever taking over books, for example, because when you think about writing a book, you take someone's life experience and condense it into like two or 300 pages, like good luck AI doing that for, for somebody. However, uh, for specific small use cases, I do see that this could probably be the future because we even see it. And this is an episode we did a while back. Like if you and I write in a Google doc, it can actually predict what you're about to say next right? Like those small things are super helpful, but it can never, I think, completely write a whole blog post for me. So it almost sounds like if you're a knowledge worker and you want to like build your skills as a moat, like be defensible against this coming thing, uh, it probably sounds like it's a good thing to learn would be how to express yourself. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about blog posts and stuff like that. But it, like I said, it could be presentations at work, it could be, uh, it could be marketing copy, it could be any of that type of stuff. It, it, it sounds like it would be a good skill to learn how to do storytelling, how to, um, 
how to capture those kind of like things and notice things that you can then work into something uh, more personality driven because the actual mechanics of busting out uh, copy and that type of stuff, uh, it sounds like that that can be automated, but maybe storytelling, we should all learn how to, <laughs> those type of skills as a, as a moat against the, the coming tide. Well, I think one interesting use case that I could see happen is let's say you and I write a blog post and then we run it through an AI app that maybe um, eliminates filler words and then also rewrites certain sentences or uses um, other words to, to make sure that it hits more keywords so it becomes more SEO friendly. So it kind of does a rewriting for you and I can see how something like that could be super powerful uh, if it doesn't exist yet already. But completely from scratch, I don't see that happening because storytelling is such a human element that, uh, sure, you can maybe fill in some basic features like who is the character, what happens, and yada, yada, yada. But um, I think from scratch, that would be very difficult to do. Yeah, again, in the live stream, uh, Giacomo, one of our Productivity Academy members, he says, that's why I'm into Obsidian and making sense and connect uniquely uh, unique concepts and ideas. And yeah, this is something we talked about back in uh, the productivity show TPS 387 with Nick Milo. Uh, and that's the thing about these, these kind of like linked note-taking tools, for lack of a better word, personal knowledge management. It's not just about capturing information and uh, having it organized well. It's making the connections and sparking ideas. And so that's a, a great take by Giacomo. So again, I'll have a link to that uh, TPS 387, where Nick Milo and I talked about all this type of stuff. All right. So that is uh, topic number two. So let's move over to the third one here. And uh, that is, and this is a question that came up recently, is, is it more productive to focus on one screen or device or to have multiple screens and devices? So uh, personally, I'm a big fan of having one big monitor next to another monitor. But this, uh, this issue came up recently where on the podcast, Marmel talked about how for years when, while she was working at AE, she worked off just her laptop screen, right? And recently, uh, a few, a few, maybe a few months ago, she now has a new big monitor on top of that as well. And so um, she kind of begged the question, why didn't I do this earlier? I'm actually seeing that I'm so much more productive. And for the longest time, um, I've always advocated to people that two screens is the way to go. However, a lot of people have said over the years as well, that's actually, it doesn't matter if you have two screens or three screens. What, what actually matters is the amount of real estate that you have. So for example, if you have a 24 inch screen and another 24 inch screen, you can have two monitors or you have one big 50 inch screen and you can kind of have the same effects. And so that kind of begs the question, is it better to have one monitor or one screen or multiple ones? Uh, what what has your experience been, Bricks? Yeah, so for myself personally, I have a 27 inch monitor uh, that I look at straight ahead, and then I have my MacBook Pro open uh, off to the right as a second monitor, uh, and that's worked pretty well for me. Uh, this also came up a lot when there was this there was this big trend of people who who decided they were just going to work off their iPads, and uh, they were like. I'm done with I'm done with computers. Uh, it's the uh, hashtag iPad life for me. Uh, and one of the benefits that you always heard about that is it's kind of like almost enforced single tasking because you it's not like a, a computer where you can have multiple windows all over the place. You know now you can do split screen a little bit and that type of thing. But that was one of the benefits that people hyped up was almost enforced single tasking. Um, me personally, uh, I will also say that a lot of those people, it seems like have gone back to the Mac now. So uh, I just wanted to throw that in there. Uh, but uh, yeah, for me, I'm, I'm an agreement that I think screen real estate is a bit more important than whether you have one or two monitors. Um, I like having a second monitor off to the side just for like, reference stuff. Like sometimes I have my calendar over there. Um, sometimes I have uh, just stuff that I don't want to be focusing on, but throw it off to the side. Um, that's how I personally do it. Uh, but uh, I've been using two monitors for a very long time and I'm just used to it. Uh, I'm curious, Tan, you, so you said you have your, your big monitor. Um, 
what do you do for the second one? Is it also your laptop screen or do you actually have two physical monitors? So my setup here is I have a 27 inch monitor at home and then next to it is my MacBook Pro. And I'm uh, very proud to say it's still the functioning 2013 Retina mm -hmm. <laughs> MacBook Pro that's almost uh, 10 years old now. Uh, it's still working, but it's definitely on its uh, last legs. Uh, I think it's going to be replaced sometime this year. But um, yeah, I've been using two monitors for the longest time. And the only downside I see with one monitor, which I've seen a few friends have at home, is that when you have one big monitor, if you just look ahead of you, then yes, you can put other windows to the side, but it's still there in, in, in sight versus when you have a second monitor and you kind of put it on the side, if you have like a bunch of reference material on, let's say my left, which is where my laptop is, when I look straight ahead, I just see the writing, for example, that I'm working on. I don't see like any other windows floating anywhere else. And so when I use the reference material, I just kind of like tilt my head to the left and then I can see, oh, like here's some reference material that I can use and then I can kind of go back and forth. So I find that a little bit more uh, easier to focus compared to having one big monitor and then having like stuff on the left or on the right hand side because it kind of distracts me. Um, the only advantage I do see is that uh, going back and forth between stuff is a little easier on one big monitor, especially if you can do like command tab, for example, very quickly or something like that. Um, or if you're doing a lot of like data transfer or data manipulation from one app to another, uh, having one big monitor, I think is a little easier, but for specific cases, like, like I just mentioned where you do writing, where you need to focus on your writing and have some reference material on the side, I find it a little easier to do and less distracting when you have two monitors. What I don't want to do uh, is have, because uh, I bring all this up because <laughs> uh, I am actually quite tempted, uh, even though financially it makes no sense, but I'm actually quite tempted by the new uh, Apple cinema or what is it called studio display. Uh, I, I wasn't that into it until I was walking through Best Buy the other day and I happened to see one there and uh, it looks really, really nice. Uh, but what I don't want to do, so I'm kind of tempted to have two 27 inch monitors on my desk, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but what I don't want to do is do what I used to do back in my corporate days where you're kind of like staring straight ahead, but you've got your, it's kind of like on the divide between the two monitors. Uh, I like the, this idea of having the big monitor like right in front of me uh, and then something off to the side. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to decide how to do this. Uh, Art in the live stream uh, has another one of his hot takes, which is uh, the more screens and devices you have, the more your workspace starts to feel like the bat cave uh, and who wants to waste time on trivial tasks in the bat cave. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm, I'm on board with having a bat cave personally, uh, but I don't know. Uh, I can, I can definitely see the other, the other way to go. It sounds like where we are in agreement is if you have one small monitor, let's say just your laptop screen, I think we both agree that's not good enough. If you want to really be effective and efficient, whether you have one big monitor, right? So like I would say 27 inch is probably a good way to start. Um, that's better than just having one, let's say small monitor, like such as your laptop monitor. I think we both agree there, whether it is two monitors or one really big monitor. I think that's where people have different uh, opinions and experiences. Uh, I'm still a uh, team two monitors, but I also see people in the live chat saying that uh, they like one big monitor. Um, I would say give it a try and see, see it for yourself. Um, if you have a laptop, I would definitely encourage you to upgrade to having a monitor plugged in because it will just make things so much easier. It's one of those things you don't know until you actually do it and see it. Then you start to realize like, wow, this is so much more powerful. I will also say that in the live stream, Tom uh, mentions a good point, which is having uh, using some of the features of operating systems like spaces on the Mac and Windows has something similar uh, to basically you can have almost different monitors or different setups using the same monitor. So that's a good way to get away with having just one monitor, but be able to kind of like flip between them. Uh, and you can set up keyboard shortcuts and that type of thing as well. I've been experimenting with spaces a little more lately. Uh, I might have a Productivity Academy forum post or, a, or maybe even a blog post about that in the, in the future. Uh, how I'm going to doing that, but it's definitely, uh, that's an option as well. I think that could be really fun with the stream deck, actually, just to switch back and forth. 
Yup. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, like uh, all good things, things must come to an end, and that includes this episode as well. So uh, we always like to make sure we end with an action item here. So what I suggest that you do is write down one action item on your to-do list that you learned from us today, and then commit to it and do it this week. We're always big fans of speed of implementation, and we've talked a lot about different topics here today. So what's the one thing that really stood out to you that you want to take action on? Whatever that might be, write that down and then take action on it this week. Uh, next week's episode is about how to create a morning routine that works for you, even if you are not a morning person. So be sure to tune back next week. And uh, if you want to find links to everything that we mentioned, you can find them in the show notes. Just swipe here or go to theproductivityshow.com slash 406. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next Productive Monday.